one of the things that we can do as a national association is take people out of their competitive environment uh, where they feel more free to share things together. We're, you know, we're focused on advocacy and representation, thought leadership, knowledge exchange, and being an agent for change. I think the most serious issue is the whole loss of confidence and public trust in medicine, science, and public health. Richard Pollack began his career in Washington, D.C. as a legislative assistant to Representative David Obey of Wisconsin. He then served as a legislative representative for the American Nurses Association. Mr. Pollack joined the AHA in 1982, a tenure which has included more than 20 years as executive vice president for advocacy and public policy prior to becoming president and CEO. And if you looked at our agenda and if you looked at the things that we're involved in, we really try to make sure that what we're doing is bipartisan. Mr. Pollock holds a bachelor's degree in political science and communications from the State University of New York at Cortland and a master's degree in public administration from American University. If we're moving toward value-based payment, which we are, and that trend is there, that means taking risk. And larger organizations are better equipped to take risk. If you enjoy the show, remember to subscribe on your favorite audio platform and visit our YouTube channel to enjoy shareable highlights from each episode. Now, let's join the conversation. Well, good morning, Rick, and welcome. Thank you, Gary. Thanks for having me. You know, I was just reflecting on your career. You've been at the AHA now for 40 plus years, CEO for eight plus years. No one knows association management, health policy, health financing, uh, advocacy more than you do. So we're honored to have you with us today, Rick. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be with you. And, uh, you know, I remember you were a senior guy when I first came to AJ, uh, a very young guy. And uh, I appreciate everything that you have done for the organization and earlier in your career. And uh, you're someone that was always uh, very well respected. Thanks. Well, why don't we kick off, Rick, with could you just de describe the AHA, the American Hospital Association? Everybody knows what it is, but probably not in the nuance and detail that you might describe. Sure. Well, you know, at the very basic level, we're the umbrella association for hospitals and health systems in the country, meaning uh, that uh, we represent all forms of ownership, whether it's investor-owned, whether it's public, whether it's private, nonprofit. And uh, there are a lot of other associations nationally that represent hospitals, and we consider themselves partners, whether it's the teaching hospitals, the uh, investor-owned hospitals, the Catholic hospitals, you know, you can go down the list. And I'm proud to say that uh, we can work all, uh, very well together. I think there are four functions for an association like ours. You know, the first is obviously advocacy and representation. And, you know, given that uh, so much revenue for hospitals comes from the federal government in the form of Medicare and Medicaid, and there's so much regulation, uh, when it comes to advocacy and representation in public policy, there is a lot uh, that we are engaged in. And that's one of the primary functions in some respects our core competency. And when they say advocacy and representation, I think it's important to recognize that it's not just capital health. It involves regulatory agencies, it involves litigation and the courts, it involves influencing the media and the think tanks and academic organizations. So that's number one. Number two is being a thought leader. That's a function of our association. Uh, you know, we like to be able to be in a position of offering ideas, ideas on how to address important challenges that we face as a nation and as a field. But we also feel as if there are times when we don't like what's going on and there's an obligation to offer alternatives. So thought leadership is the second one. The third is being uh, a, a forum for knowledge exchange. You know, uh, our members can learn a lot from themselves. Uh, they are good teachers to each other, whether it's best practices or other approaches where they can learn from each other. We have the ability and do provide a lot of forums for that. And one of the things that we can do as a national association is take people out of their competitive environment uh, where they feel more free to share things together. And then the fourth um, thing that we're really focused on is being an agent for change. I'm um, trying to do the right thing. 
bring the field in the direction of doing the right thing. And you know what? When you do that, it also helps you on your advocacy activities. So whether it's being an agent for change in improving quality, whether it's being an agent for change in addressing disparities in diversity, whether it's being an agent for change in getting our shields up to protect against cybersecurity, uh, that's where we try to be an agent for change. So those are the four key areas. Yeah. Yeah, that's a handful. I mean, it's frequently said that uh, the AHA leader, in this case you, has one of the toughest jobs in Washington because there's such a diversity of your members uh, that just keeping them all in the fold, I suppose, Rick, is uh, a key part of your job. Yeah. And, you know, that's true. I mean, there is incredible diversity within our members, and we can talk about that. But, you know, there's also an awful lot of common ground. When you think about the issues that we're facing today, uh, you know, around financial challenges, around workforce challenges, around cyber security, around the need to improve quality. Doesn't matter who you are, where you are, whether it's regionally or type of organization, all of those things are important. Rick, the AHA just published its advocacy agenda for 2023. Uh, congratulations on narrowing the list to four. <laughs> I can remember the old days a lot longer than that, so well done. Uh, but could you just review those uh, four topics? And then how do you actually get the membership together to agree that those are the four topics of choice? Well, you know, you're very generous in saying there's only four because, you know, the, I, I, internally we were um, kind of joking about it because there were probably about 82 different issues we needed yeah. before. Right. And, and I was congratulating ourselves from getting it to 82 to 75, you know, for this year. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, uh, clearly there are several that uh, go into certain categories. And, you know, financial stability and financial relief coming out of COVID is clearly one area of which there are multiple issues. Addressing the workforce challenge is a second issue of which, again, there are multiple things that we're pursuing. And you can unpack those if you want. Uh, the third is in regulatory relief. Uh, that certainly has a whole bucket of things that we're pursuing. And the fourth is um, in advancing healthcare transformation. And again, a lot of that is around equity. A lot of that is around delivery, the system reform in terms of where hospitals fit in in a changing environment. So those are the sort of four buckets, if you will, but beneath each one of them, uh, there are a lot of key issues uh, that uh, we are pursuing. Yeah, that's for sure. You spoke about uh, thought leadership. Rick, how do you think about uh, thought leadership in the sense of how you, do you develop the thought leadership agenda? Well, you know, uh, the key to developing thought leadership agendas, which are inherent in a lot of what we do, is engagement with the members. Right. You know, we've got a lot of smart folks that are leaders in our field. And we have a formal process in which we uh, develop agenda, nine regional policy boards. We've got a series of committees. Um, uh, we've got a very bright staff. And it, it's really engagement. And, you know, I always go by the theory of uh, people are invested in what they help create. So I, I think providing opportunities for people to develop these agendas. You know, for instance, the advocacy agenda I just outlined. I mean, you know, that was not the product of us just writing it up at the staff level. Uh, that went through boards. It went through um, testing things with state associations. So it's all a, a process in which we, you know, work with our key constituencies. Having been uh, at the AHA for a while back uh, years ago, as we mentioned, uh, it was obvious to me pretty quickly that leading the AHA, a large membership organization, is not for the faint of heart uh, is one thing, but uh, also what are the differences between leading a large membership organization and let's say leading a hospital or a health system or a commercial entity? I think there's just a lot of differences there that people may not realize, Rick. Yeah, you know, it goes back in some respects to the four core areas. Uh, you know, we're focused on advocacy and representation, thought leadership, knowledge exchange and being an agent for change. Uh, I don't think that necessarily that's where your typical health system or commercial enterprise is focused. Now, some of them are certainly focused 
on uh, pieces of advocacy for their own personal or own commercial interests, I should say. Some of them are focused on being an agent for change in their own communities. But I think it's those four things that make it different. The other thing that I think makes it different is that we really strive uh, to have influence, influence over driving the conversation around healthcare and furthering our advocacy agenda. And when it comes to having influence, there are probably 15 different levers that you have to use to have influence. And if I were to go through a couple of those different levers, I suspect they're a little bit different than what an individual health system or commercial enterprise might do. For instance, right. sometimes uh, we have to impose self-regulation on ourselves when we see that there's a problem out there. And if we don't act, then, hey, we're at risk of having bad regulation or legislation imposed. So we've done that when it comes to things like billing and collection guidelines. When it comes to things like um, creating an equity roadmap to make sure that people are doing uh, what they need to do to ensure diversity and address racial disparities. Uh, when it comes to influence, holding events um, is uh, an important way. Being a source, a trusted source of data and information is important. Coalition building with others is a very powerful source of influence. So I think our focus on being influential and driving the discussion is probably a little bit different than where the focus might be for uh, some of those other types of organizations. Yeah, for sure. Speaking of coalitions, you've done a great job building coalitions around specific topics or areas. What are the secrets uh, to building a coalition? You know, I think the secret is uh, being able to compartmentalize sometimes. Uh, some of uh, the coalitions where we do have common ground on are with people that we may disagree with on other issues. And you have to learn that that's okay. Um, so, you know, certainly we wrestle on a variety of issues with the commercial health insurance companies. Uh, but we also have an interest in working with them on how you handle expanded coverage. Um, you know, we wrestle with the labor unions as you might suspect on certain issues. But there again, we have some common ground when it comes to issues around expanding coverage. So I think the, the idea about coalitions is inherent in everything we do. Yeah, you name an issue, and uh, I'll tell you who we're working with on that issue. And uh, it's always more attractive to the politicians when you're in coalition because yeah. coalitions bring more votes. And you know, there's that expression of strange bedfellows. The stranger the coalition, the more interesting it is, the more votes you can bring, the more, uh, you know, the media is attracted to the story of having the strange Beth fellows being together. You mentioned uh, politics uh, in one way or another, and uh, just in your time at the AHA, we've moved to a highly polarized society and, and governmental process. Um, how do you manage that, Rick? That just feels like just making things real complicated. Very carefully. You know, it, it's, it's been difficult um, to navigate sometimes. Uh, and, you know, the, the fact of the matter is we are a bipartisan organization. You know, while we have a very large political action committee, one of the largest in healthcare, you know, you'll notice that uh, if you look at our political giving, it's probably a 50-50 split. And it's not reflective of saying that we want any one party to be in power. It's really a question of working with the people that our members at the grassroots level are closest to, that are most accessible, that are sympathetic to our views, and uh, want to work with us. Um, whatever we do, we really try to make it bipartisan. And if you looked at our agenda, and if you looked at the things that we're involved in, we really try to make sure that what we're doing is bipartisan that our champions are always a Republican and a Democrat, and we try to stay below the political radar screen and keep our issues out of uh, the crossfire. Does that mean that sometimes we don't get caught in it? Yeah, we do. Um, you know, we, uh, and this goes back to in my previous role here at AHA, eh? we supported the Affordable Care Act. Um, yep. We, um, you know, not only supported it, but we defended it three times in the uh, Supreme Court and once during repeal and replace. 
that was in the political crossfire, but it was also something that we felt very strongly about in terms of the principle of expanding coverage to literally millions of people. Um, so there are times when you just have to take a principled stand um, and, and do it in a, in a gentlemanly way, if you will. Um, but most of the issues we carry, we try to make bipartisan. Mm -hmm. So you have a Republican House now. Uh, that means new committee chairman, new committee assignments. Is, is there just a lot of plain old educating as part of what you'll be doing now with the new House uh, leaders? Yeah, you know, it, it, it is interesting. If you look at the new leaders in the House, um, you know, they, they haven't been together as leaders for uh, many years. I, I think somebody, you know, it's interesting, uh, with, uh, Speaker Pelosi leaving and Steny Hoyer, the majority leader leaving, and uh, the assistant leader, uh, Clyburn, uh, now around, but not in one of those top leadership roles. They had, I think, over 120 years of experience in working together as leaders. Um, if you look at the new Republican leadership, um, you know, maybe 30 or 35 years of collected experience of working with leaders. If you look at the new Democratic leadership in the House, which represents significant uh, generational change, maybe 24 years of leadership, and any of them have not been, uh, in either case, chairs of committees that actually produce legislation. So it is a different uh, set of experiences. And your point, uh, so many of the members of the House are new, uh, and over half of them, I believe, have never even served in the majority. So, wow. yes, a lot of education, a lot of education, and we've been doing that with a lot of newer members. Um, but, you know, one of the things I think we're going to see, given split government, and this is something that you always see uh, when you have split government, is a lot more activity on the uh, administrative executive side, a lot more action uh, from uh, the executive side of the House because they know that it's going to be difficult to get things done through legislation. Now, having said that, I will also say that, um, you know, HHS has a full plate of policy issues in health care that they're working on that has nothing to do with the legislative process. You know, they have to implement the, infl the Inflation Reduction Act. That involves a, a whole series of negotiations over uh, you know, drug prices. Um, they are in the midst of doing the remedy based upon our unanimous decision in the Supreme Court on the 340B case, which mandates that drug companies provide us with discounts when purchasing outpatient drugs. Uh, Medicare Advantage, you know, they're looking at auditing the commercial plant in particular uh, and holding them accountable for a variety of different behaviors. The surprise billing issue is still in the courts and being implemented. Uh, you know, so there are a whole series of things that really don't depend upon legislation where HHS has a, a full play. Well, let's move to, to COVID for a moment and uh, how you played your role, the AHA role, uh, during that. But one thing you spoke about a bit ago is the trust that people have in the data of the American Hospital Association, and the AHA uh, has just done a terrific job, I think, on that point through the years. We ran into a problem with certain other uh, federal government sources, CDC comes to mind, uh, where people did lose confidence in the data, and I think part of it was just the kind of politics entering into all this. How did you have to navigate those shoals during, uh, during COVID? Yeah, and I'll go back to the data thing because that was a, a bump in the road for sure. Um, but when you think about the whole COVID experience, um, you know, and you talk about coalitions before, you know, one of the most important parts of the COVID experience was uh, partnerships. Uh, and one of the most important partnerships that we had was with the American Nurses Association and American Medical Association, where uh, we were constantly out there working together in a variety of different forums, television ads, radio ads, public service announcements, all kinds of things, you know, to promote following the public health guidelines, uh, following the uh, masking up procedures, getting vaccinated. And in fact, just this week, and we're releasing yet a new uh, public service announcement uh, from the three organizations that's focused on still getting vaccinated and keeping it up to date. But on the government side, uh, you know, with the federal partners, I got to tell you, 
uh, Gary, uh, we really did have incredible accessibility uh, to the key people in both administrations, in both uh, the Trump and the Biden administrations, not only at the White House level, but at the Heath Bates level. And um, I, I think we all approached it, uh, not as lobbying organizations, but as partners in what was a historic public health crisis. And I think it was very productive. You know, you think about what we did uh, during the Trump administration in creating a ventilator reserve in partnership with uh, the administration uh, when, you know, things were really tough at the beginning and ventilators were an issue. Uh, we worked very closely with the Trump administration and the distribution of the provider relief funds and making sure that they were targeted in the right way and the appropriate accountabilities were in place to ensure uh, that the funds were going to be used with um, appropriate accountability. Uh, vaccine uh, distribution and the encouragement of people to get vaccines, that was something that kind of took us into the Biden administration. And we were partners there, particularly in getting those vaccines in the uh, vulnerable communities. Now, to your point, there were frustrations with data collection. And uh, some of those frustrations were during the beginning where people were just trying to get the right data in the right time period. And everybody was under all sorts of pressures and, you know, having to report on certain things that were less important than others. Yeah, we had disagreements over that. And at one point, I think uh, during the previous administration, there were six different reporting systems that were put in place uh, that uh, kind of went back and forth, some of them between DC and some of them between HHS. Um, it's a long story. Uh, I, I think we, uh, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, we were able to work it through. I think the most the most serious issue now really um, is the whole loss of confidence and public trust in medicine, science, and public health as a result of the whole experience. And it's directly related to the political polarization that I don't think any of us in healthcare ever believed we would have seen in a circumstance like this. So. Well, thankfully, doctors, nurses, and hospitals continue to be high in public confidence. So that's important, I think, particularly when it comes to your point about the science and so on being under attack. Uh, you know, here's another question, Rick, and that is that um, if you look at the hospital's role in vaccine administration, testing, information, you make that point, um, you know, you could look at it like hospitals really took over uh, some of the public health responsibilities for the country because public health just un wasn't organized and funded enough to do that. And I'm not sure that hospitals were compensated for that, by the way, but uh, the question is going forward if there are other infectious disease crises, do you think that hospitals will continue to be in this role of, of taking over certain of what people would traditionally think is a public health role? Well, you know, it, it varies by community. Um, you're right. In so many communities across the country, we became the de facto public health system. And, you know, in so many of those communities, the public health infrastructure was uh, either poorly funded, neglected, or stepchildren. Um, we stepped in, no question about it. And the health systems uh, and the community hospitals, they were there. And part right. of it, is, you know, it goes back to the trust issue. We were the most trusted partners uh, Correct. You know, when it came to the public. And, you know, that H was a place that was a sanctuary for so many right. people. No question about it. So looking forward, what does that mean? Where do we go? I think then the recognition um, that we need to pay more attention to our public health system. And I think that between after action analysis by a variety of different entities and by uh, congressional action, to bolster some of our public health infrastructure, um, hopefully we'll learn some lessons from the past along those lines. Um, and uh, regardless, we're still gonna be players in public health. We're still gonna be supporters, and it'll depend upon the community that we're in um, in terms of the capabilities. So I don't think we ever walk away from it, uh, but uh, clearly there needs to be stronger support for the public health agencies and those functions. Yeah. 
And and when hospitals pick up these public health uh, responsibilities, particularly at the last minute, uh, making sure there's some compensation for that would also be a good thing. Let me turn to another topic of uh, much debate, and that is that during COVID, it's clear that the providers took brunt of expenses, brunt of disorientation almost in terms of what was going on. While that was going on, the health insurers really felt like they were in a windfall situation. Um, You know, what's your view of that, Rick, and how is that going to be kind of resolved in the future? Yeah. Well, you know, there's no question that um, uh, they were collecting premiums and they weren't paying out much from those premiums. And there's no question that they not only uh, experienced the windfall, and you can see that in the financials that have come out, uh, but they never stepped up to the plate to help very much. You know, um, when CMS was doing things to help us in terms of regulatory relief, in terms of advanced payment, uh, to help us get through cash flow problems when there were government mandates to shut down all uh, scheduled procedures. Um, you know, CMS, to their credit, stepped up. Insurance companies were nowhere to be seen. And I, I think that that was outrageous. Um, and uh, it's something that uh, is, is a very unfortunate uh, situation that we went through. And you know what? Those insurers, they continue to contribute to some of the problems we face. Uh, you know, whether it's uh, slow pay or no pay or other types of behaviors, uh, it's a, they, they, they create real hurdles. And, you know, we're facing an incredible workforce challenge right now. You know, part of the workforce challenge is exacerbated by these prior authorization requirements that they impose on our clinicians that end up having to spend more time, you know, asking for permission. And, uh, you know, we're in the business of providing care, and it seems like they're in the business of denying care. Yeah, I I agree with that for sure. Well, uh, hopefully we can work to some resolution going forward. And, you know, this may be a good good place to bring up fee-for-service versus value care. Uh, How do you think about that, Rick, both in terms of um, what's likely to be developed, let's say, over the next 10 years, and then how does all of this affect uh, hospitals? You know, in many ways, I, I think that the, the train has left the station on value-based payment. Um, and if you think about value-based payment, I think you have to think of it as a continuum. On one side of the continuum, if you're a Medicare provider, you're already doing value-based payment whether you know it or you're not. Uh, you know, it, it still may be on a fee-for-service chassis, but you're getting penalized for readmissions. You're getting penalized for hospital-acquired conditions. There is a BP payment mechanism in place. So if you're a Medicare provider, you're already in that load on one in one form or another. But if you move down that continuum, uh, you get to uh, bundling. And there are a lot of hospitals that are involved in different types of bundling uh, mechanisms. If you move further down that continuum, you get to the whole issue of, you know, accountable care organizations and alternative payment methods. And if you for, move further down that continuum, you know, we see a lot of hospitals that are either provider-led organizations that are running their own health plans. Um, and, and we know that um, uh, that has a lot of promise. Um, but when you move down that continuum in that regard and you begin to take responsibility for the total cost of care for an attributed population, that's one where... Uh, well, we have a lot of hospital systems that have been doing that for a long time. Uh, I think that uh, that's one where we need partnerships, creative partnerships. Yep. And, yep. Uh, you know, in some cases, if you've seen one model, you've just seen one. Right. But I think that we're all moving down that continuum in one form or another. Can the private sector do that by itself, Rick, or do we need more uh, federal governmental involvement to encourage that kind of partnerships? Well, you know, um, the ACA, to its credit, um, you know, established the uh, roadmap to move down this continuum. Um, And uh, in some respects, uh, as we uh, went forward during the Obama administration and even during the Trump administration, this was bipartisan, by the way, you know, we talk about the partisan stuff. There is no divide here. Uh, Everybody recognizes that value-based payment 
is the direction in which we're headed. And by the way, it represents innovation and it represents uh, private sector activity. Um, so I think that it's something that will will continue for sure. But the real question that you are getting at, which is perhaps the most challenging one, is where do we find the partners as hospitals to do it? Right. Because right. many of the insurers, at least the very big ones, really don't have an interest in getting engaged. The big insurers, you know, people criticize us for market consolidation. You know, big insurers are the ones that are consolidated, and many of them have no interest in being partners in value-based payment because they have the power to just encode rates on us uh, because of their marketplace power. So we tend to look at smaller regional health insurance plans. Uh, other partners could be uh, physician groups uh, that can work together with us in building these accountable care organizations or um, organizations that are willing to take responsibility for the total cost of care. So as you know, Rick, um, most of the hospitals in the country, over 50% of their revenues now come from the federal government. And in many cases, some of the urban uh, hospitals, a lot higher percentage than that. Baby boomers continuing to come into Medicare, chronic disease is growing a lot as these uh, boomers age. Uh, what's your view, Rick, of um, this increase in federal government uh, payment, which is going to continue for at least through the end of this decade and more and more of a hospital's revenue is going to be coming from the gov federal government. How's that going to affect the hospital strategy and how will that affect the AHA strategy? Yeah, well, it certainly puts the pressure on ensuring that there's adequate payment under Medicare and Medicaid program for uh, that reason. But remember, a lot of the growth in Medicare is in Medicare Advantage. And Medicare Advantage is, you know, really a, a private sector version of the Medicare program. So that's where growth is taking place. So it isn't necessarily under the traditional model. And then with the expiration of the public health emergency, um, there is going to be a big transition in Medicaid, uh, where a lot of people, uh, because of redeterminations that are required, uh, may be losing their Medicaid status and moving into um, uh, exchanges, uh, which are, again, private sector oriented. So I don't know where it all sorts out from a number perspective. Clearly, the demographics of Medicare, we know more Medicare beneficiaries, 10,000 baby boomers become 65 every single day. Right. But if they're in Medicare Advantage, the younger ones, uh, or even the older ones, that's 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 where the numbers sort out. I think... Yeah. No matter what, the federal government is always going to have a significant role in the financing of health care um, by virtue of the size of those programs. And then you throw in the VA on top of that, uh, and uh, you know they'll always have a role. Now, one of the things that you mentioned that's important, and one of the things that part of our advocacy agenda is the issue of those hospitals that um, have such a high utilization of Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, that they become de facto public entities when you think about it. And many of those organizations serve uh, very vulnerable communities. And that's why we're suggesting that we create a special category for them, you know, uh, something called metropolitan anchor hospitals uh, that ensure that they continue to be able to provide the essential public services that they do in those two ends. Let me go back to a point you made about consolidation. Uh, hospitals have been consolidating steadily for 30 years, and initially, I think uh, a lot of the impetus was because insurance companies were doing it, but now it seems like they're having to go to regional pairings because of uh, regulatory issues, but do you see this consolidation of the health systems and hospitals continuing, Rick, going forward? I think it'll continue. Of course, we're under the spotlight of the you know, Federal Trade Commission uh, that is looking very, very, uh, you know, close. The plug scrutiny there. But, you know, half the hospitals in the country right now are part of system of some kind, whether they're regional or national. And I, I think that it'll continue. And it'll continue for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, if we're moving toward value-based payment, which we are, in that trend is there, that means taking risk. 
and larger organizations are better equipped to take risk. Um, larger organizations that are part of systems are more able, uh, and this is an area you spend a lot of time in, when it comes to capital and Wall Street and bonds and tax exempt bonds, you know, large right. organizations have more access to that. Yep. Um, if we're trying to ensure that there's uh, access that's seamless uh, for service among uh, various organizations, putting together systems and systems provide access to a wider variety of things. If we're interested in taking out clinical variation, systems through systemness are be better able to leverage that objective. Um, and sometimes, let's face it, uh, systems come together and they preserve hospitals that might have gone out of business. So, you know, there are a lot of different reasons that systems have value. And I think during COVID, we saw the real value of systems. Uh, they were much better positioned to move both human resources and support around. And I, I think that they um, really demonstrated the value in so many ways. Now, does that mean that everybody has to be part of a system? You know, it depends upon the nature of the community that you serve and uh, the marketplace that you're in. But clearly, they have a lot of uh, value. Yeah, clearly. And, and that really, really was emphasized during COVID. I agree with you on that. How do you think about the large cap companies, a lot of capital like CVS or Walgreens or Walmart and Amazon elbowing their way into primary care. And CVS just announced the acquisition of Oak Street Health, for example, 160 units or clinics and 600 doctors involved in that. But how do you think about that? And is there a reason to be concerned about that for hospitals, Rick? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you where the reason is to be concerned, but I'll just say also, I think what it's important is to recognize that, uh, you know, for hospitals, you know, listen, we're always going to be there to provide essential public services uh, as long as we can survive the financial and workforce challenges that we face. Uh, but, you know, when it comes to providing trauma services, when it comes to providing sophisticated diagnostics and therapies, sophisticated surgeries, I don't see that happening in the CVS. Uh, or the Walgreens. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we have a foundational role that we play uh, in providing essential services that is going to need to be financed properly. Um, and that involves an investment uh, that uh, involves, you know, the public for sure. Now, you know, the, the question of how we view them, you know, I got to tell you, some of these folks need to be viewed as partners. Um, and we can work together as we build systems uh, and learn from them in terms of partnerships, whether it's in uh, digital care, whether it's in making care more convenient, um, whether it is uh, trying to you know, find ways where we can both be productive together. The downside is a lot of them, you know, while we move to our clinical integration, uh, a lot of what they're engaged is in disintegration. On, you got to worry about the continuity of care for the people that they are engaged with. But even more fundamentally than that, while some of them are partners, some of them are also predators. You know, they have very, very deep pockets. They don't take care of poor people. They only take care of people that are well insured. Uh, they don't take Medicaid. In many cases, they're not open 24 7. Um, and uh, they don't have nearly the same breaking the charging accountabilities that we have, and they don't provide community benefit. So, you know, they are in a different place. And um, in some cases, uh, you know, uh, they, they are in fact predators. I wish they were more partners. Yeah, I agree with that. You know, coming back to the all important issue of data, uh, and you mentioned continuity of care, the one thing that hospitals do have is data systems that will underlie continuity of care. None of these other uh, large cap companies we're talking about is going to have that. And I don't know whether hospitals are appropriately compensated for that data, but uh, it's really an important asset that they bring to the community. Yeah. Rick, this has been an awesome interview. We've benefited from your wisdom uh, today. I have two remaining questions, if I could. One of them is, what advice do you give uh, young people who might be interested in working in an association like the American Hospital Association, what advice do you give them? 
Well, you know, one is to understand what an association is. <laughs> uh, I don't think a lot of people really understand it. Uh, you know, I started my career working on Capitol Hill. I never imagined that I would be involved in an association. Yeah, they used to lobby me, but I never really understood the role of an association. And, you know, some of it goes back to those four core areas that I mentioned before. And I, and I think that, you know, if people are interested in associations, you know, it's a special place. You know, it's not like we're a regular business. It's not like we're a government entity. It's not like we have authority over our members. We can only exert moral suasion and demonstrate value to them. Uh, but one of the interesting things that people want to think about is if you want an ability to have an impact, associations have the ability to have an impact, have an influence to drive the conversation and to make a difference. And I thought the other thing that associations bring, and of course, I'm speaking from the perspective of a fairly large uh, umbrella associations, is multidisciplinary opportunity. You know, we have our clinical folks, we have our legal folks, we have our frontline lobbies, we have our policy folks, we have people that specialize in education, we have people that specialize in data. So I think that uh, what an association offers is the ability to make a difference, the ability to have influence, and multidisciplinary tracks that one could pursue. Yeah, that's for sure. Second question, I'm sure you get uh, a lot of uh, people coming up to you and saying, Rick, I would thinking about going into hospital administration in some way, shape, or form. Uh, what advice do you give them, Rick? You know, one, one of the things uh, that I give as advice is, and, and I've been talking about this for some time now, as has my predecessors that you knew, um, you know, uh, we're redefining the H. So when we think about the H, and it's an iconic symbol that has incredible trust. You know, when people see that sign on the road, uh, you know, it says, follow me. And, you know, you'll be taking care of people that have, you know, the highest standards for ethics and integrity. Uh, but that age is changing. You know, half of the surgeries that we do today are on an outpatient basis. So right. people think about a career in hospitals, just don't think about hospitals as an inpatient building. Uh, you know, so much of the care is being done outside the four walls. What we do in the four walls will always be significant, but it's beyond that. And if people are thinking about careers, you just got to think wider. Uh, so many of our hospitals are now, like I said, uh, they're taking responsibility for care for an attributed population. They're doing health care at home. Uh, there are so many different aspects to what hospitals do. So I think you have to think wider than just you know, hospital administration in the building per se. And the other thing you have to think about is partnerships. I think that that's part of the future um, is partnerships in terms of working with different community entities, but also partnerships in how we transform the system uh, to, uh, you know, help manage care across the continuum. Because at the end of the day, one of the things we really have to do is making sure there is seamless coordination and people don't get bounced around from one facility to the next. And that's very different than uh, what we probably have focused on in the past. Yeah, well said. Rick, thank you very much for your time today. I'll just make an editorial comment, which is not only are hospitals uh, better off having you as the president and CEO of the American Hospital Association, but I think all of healthcare is. So well done. Thank you. Thank you for thank being you here. Thank you so much. It's great being with you.